Hello, David Nassine here. Gretchen Butler and I were coming up with a talk to give you some introduction to some brain MRI sequences. The goals for this talk are to recognize some common sequences, to know which of those sequences are best for certain types of things such as hemorrhage or tumor, and how you can apply some of this knowledge to select appropriate imaging protocols. So most of the brain MRIs you're going to see are going to have somewhere around six or more unique sequences and sometimes in several different planes. In contrast to CT, almost every single one of the MRI sequences you see is a unique acquisition as opposed to a CAT scan where the images that you see oftentimes are taken at one time point and reconstructed in different types of images such as your soft tissue reconstruction and your bone reconstruction and multiple different planes. So the types of images we're going to focus on for this talk are the T1 weighted images, the T2 weighted images, flare images, diffusion weighted, susceptibility weighted, or T2 star weighted, and post contrast images. So some of the things that are helpful to recognize a particular type of sequence are to look at certain characteristics such as the fat that's present on the image, any fluid, the gray-white differentiation, and the presence or absence of contrast. So this is an example of a T1 weighted image. You can see some subcutaneous fat that is bright. The CSF signal is dark. The gray matter is gray and the white matter is white, which you can remember is anatomic. Gray is gray and white is white. You'll often hear it said that T1 weighted images are good for anatomy and T2 weighted images are good for pathology. Most of the reason for that is that many of the disease processes that you'll see are associated with edema, which shows bright signal on T2, but generally shows dark signal on T1, which is just a little less apparent to our eyes. However, there are a few things that you'll want to take note of where disease processes cause increased signal on T1-weighted images, especially certain phases of blood products, especially subacute phase. Fat-containing tumors, such as lipomas, liposarcomas, dermoid tumors, melanocytic tumors, slowly flowing blood in blood vessels can, can lead to high signal and even occluded blood vessels can show up as high signal on a T1 weighted image. And then certain forms of calcification and mineralization. So you'll note on this T2 weighted image that CSF signal is quite bright and that we have the reversal of the anatomical gray-white differentiation that we had with T1 weighted images. You look at the cortex and the deep gray nuclei and you'll see that they're a little bit brighter than the white matter is. You may also have heard that fat is dark on a T2 weighted image. Now that is technically true, but most of the images that you're going to see are going to be T2 turbo spin echo or T2 fast spin echo. And the reason for that is these images would take too long to do the old fashioned way. So we take some shortcuts and those shortcuts no longer let fat get back to what would be the, the baseline. So fat does generate signal on most modern T2 weighted sequences. So here we have another T2 weighted image, slightly lower in the head. Recall that we talked before about how T2 weighted images being more sensitive to fluid will show us edematous pathology as bright, a little more easily seen than on T1 weighted images where that same edema looks dark, although not quite as good as flare images, which we'll see in a second. But I do want you to take note of the flow voids that you'll see here in the left middle cerebral artery, distal internal carotid arteries, and even the right posterior communicating artery. Now the reason we have a flow void is MRI needs several different pulses in order to generate some signal. And on a T2 weighted image, there is an initial pulse, waiting, and another pulse at 180 degrees, and then waiting, and then the echo comes back. So the amount of time that it takes, the blood that was in the blood vessel at the time that the initial pulse happened is long gone by the time the echo comes back. And in the blood vessel, when the echo happens, there is new blood that never received that initial pulse. So when that happens, we have what is called a flow void. So fast flowing blood generates a flow void on T2 weighted images. You'll also want to remember a fairly short list of dark pathology on T2 weighted images. Things that will generate that will include things where there's densely packed tumor cells, such as with lymphoma or other small round and blue tumors, certain phases of blood products, again, flow voids in fast flowing blood vessels, and tumors that have fast-flowing blood, such as arteriovenous malformations and, and highly vascular tumor, such as paraganglioma, and then certain forms of calcification and mineralization. 
Next, we'll talk about flare images, which stands for fluid attenuation, inversion, recovery. One way to think of flare images is that it's a super T2 weighted image that only has the water removed. Now, that's a drastic oversimplification, but you'll notice on this image that the ventricle signal is dark and the CSF within the sulci also dark. Now, in order for fluid to be nulled on this sequence, it has to be very watery, meaning water next to water next to water because each and every proton in the image is influenced by its surrounding environment. So, for example, water inside of an edematous brain lesion will not be nulled, but water within a fluid collection such as a cystic tumor or chronic hematoma can be nulled. Another nice feature about the flare images is that you're not saturating your retinas with bright signal like you are oftentimes with a T2-weighted image. And most of what stands out as being bright signal on a flare does tend to be pathologic. This is an example of a turboflare image with fat saturation in the sagittal plane. And you'll see that there's some radiating bands of high signal coming out of the lateral ventricles. And this is pretty pathognomonic for multiple sclerosis. These things are called Dawson's fingers. And they have this particular orientation because they are surrounding veins. They have a perivenular location. Flare images are nice to detect small lesions, lesions that are out very peripherally in the brain, especially in the subcortical white matter or even the cortex itself, and in the brainstem. But as mentioned before, lots of artifacts with this particular sequence. Next we have diffusion-weighted images, which you'll often see abbreviated as DWI. Now what these images are, are a picture of the motion of water in several different planes. And for your standard diffusion-weighted images, that's three planes. And you'll take note that the Signal characteristics of the brain look quite similar to that of a flare sequence, especially when you apply fat saturation. Cortex is a little brighter than the white matter, and there's not much fluid signal coming back at all. So one of our main jobs with this sequence is to determine whether or not there is restricted diffusion. Now most of what you'll see as showing up with bright signal on the diffusion-weighted images is pathologic, but we need to decide is there or is there not restriction of diffusion. The reason why this is a little bit complicated is because the diffusion weighted images have some T2 weighting to them, so things that have a lot of signal from edema will oftentimes show up a little bit bright on the diffusion weighted images. Therefore, we have a second set of images that we use to correlate with the diffusion weighted images called the ADC map, or apparent diffusion coefficient map. It looks like an ugly T2 weighted image that's very low res. But what it serves to do is it shows us exactly a picture of water diffusion. So high signal on this sequence represents freely moving water, and dark signal means not very mobile water. Here we have an example of DWI and ADC images viewed in conjunction to come up with the correct diagnosis. On the top image, we have some high signal within the right cerebral hemisphere in a portion of the right middle cerebral artery territory. If we look at this same region on the ADC map, we see that it exhibits low signal. And this represents true restricted diffusion, and this is a subacute right MCA territory infarct. Now, if we are to watch this over the next few days, the ADC map signal will become brighter and brighter, and there's usually a time when the diffusion-weighted images are still bright, and the ADC map images become bright, and that's what we call T2 shine through. So in this way, looking at the diffusion weighted in the ADC map and also other sequences, we can pinpoint with pretty good accuracy within a few days when an infarct happened. So here we're going to have an example of T2 shine through. We've got some images in DWI and ADC of the posterior fossa, not quite perfectly matched, but you can see increased signal in the diffusion weighted images and also increased signal on the ADC map, predominantly the white matter of the cerebellum. So this is not really restricted diffusion. This is T2 shine through. The common causes of restricted diffusion include acute infarct, where the diffusion weighted images turn positive within minutes with true restriction of diffusion and, and low signal on the ADC map, which generally lasts at least five days. And around that point is when the ADC signal starts to drift upward as the infarct progresses from true restricted diffusion to T2 shine through. Tumors with densely packed cells, high nucleus to cytoplasm ratios, including the small rounded blue cell tumors. Certain phases of blood products will result in restricted diffusion, especially the hyperacute and late subacute phases. Certain abscesses, especially pyogenic bacterial abscesses, 
but occasionally fungal abscess, and abscess is caused by other atypical organisms. Epidermoid tumors, which also includes the middle ear version of the epidermoid tumor, the cholesteatoma, acute demyelinating lesions such as those from multiple sclerosis, and cortical restricted diffusion in encephalitis. Susceptibility weighted images have been designed to accentuate any local perturbations in the magnetic field. This is especially useful for identifying small foci of calcification or microhemorrhage. So susceptibility weighted images are fairly new and T2 star weighted gradient echo images are kind of the older version of this sequence that will show you slightly fewer abnormalities than the SWI images will. Here's an example of a T2 star weighted image that's showing multiple punctate foci of dark black signal through what we call blooming artifact where the imaging abnormality appears larger than it really is. For contrast enhanced MRI we typically use T1 weighted images and we use gadolinium as the contrast agent as opposed to general radiology and CT where iodine is the agent and iodine typically blocks more x-rays than the rest of your body does, gadolinium is used because of its particular magnetic properties and the number of electrons in its outer shells. The presence of gadolinium causes local T1 shortening, which on a T1 weighted image shows up as brighter signal. So note in the top image that many of the vessels appear bright. You would think that that would be a great sign that this is a post-contrast image, but it turns out to be very unreliable and certain kinds of Pre-contrast T1-weighted images will show similar findings. But if you look at the bottom image, you'll find a real good sign that this is a post-contrast image when you look at the nose and you see there's a lot of mucosal enhancement in the nose. This is one of your best signs on a brain MRI that contrast has been used. Some words to the wise about contrast-enhanced images. You should always compare your pre-contrast with your post-contrast T1-weighted images because many common mimics of enhancement turn out to be bright on the pre-contrast images. You'll always want to scrutinize the leptomeningeal space for abnormal enhancement that you can see with meningitis and leptomeningeal spread of carcinoma. Post-contrast flare images, believe it or not, are a little bit more sensitive than the T1-weighted images at very low concentrations of gadolinium, so, so very subtle cases or very early cases. Of pathology. Another very useful but very specialized sequence is a 3D heavily T2 weighted sequence and you'll see mostly T2 space, drive, and CISS. These are very high resolution, very thin section images where fluid is bright and just about everything else is extremely dark. But what this allows us to do is see the cranial nerves very well as long and smooth straight filling defects within this fluid and the vessels which tend to be tubular, very curvy, vessels that generally connect to parent vessels. Many times we're looking for vascular impingement on cranial nerves, leading to such things as hemifacial spasm on the seventh nerve, pulsatile tinnitus in the eighth nerve, and trigeminal neuralgia with the fifth nerve. We can also look for the quality of the fluid signal present within the cochlea and in the vestibular structures. Just for fun, this is an axial T2 weighted space sequence showing all the cranial nerves that we can see in a really high-res format. Another very important set of sequences that you'll see in MRI are the fat suppression techniques. The idea is to null the signal of very hyper-intense fat so that we can see other abnormalities hiding underneath, either small or subtle. Many times the presence of contrast enhancement within fat can be very difficult to pick up, so one of the more frequent sequences you'll see is frequency selective fat saturation where an additional pulse is set out at fat's resonant frequency in order to null the fat. Some other techniques you'll see are inversion recovery techniques such as STIR which is kind of like a T2 weighted image with the fat suppressed, SPARE which is kind of a similar type sequence, and Dixon's fat suppression which is a totally different version of fat suppression. All of which decrease the fat signal so that other more subtle signal abnormalities can be accentuated. Frequency selective fat suppression can be used on top of many other types of sequences as well. This is an example showing how vital T1 weighted fat suppressed images can be. The arrow points to a carotid artery dissection. The flow void in the center at the tip of the arrow is the patent part of the vessel with the crescentic high T1 signal representing the intramural hematoma or the subacute hyperintense blood products within.
If the normal fat in the neck were not suppressed, this would be very difficult to appreciate. Another very important reason to use T1-weighted fat-saturated images is to increase the conspicuity of soft tissue enhancement in the setting of adjacent, very hyper-intense fat. So this example shows us the abnormal enhancement surrounding the optic nerve on the right. You're going to want to use fat-saturated images anytime you're looking for skull marrow lesions, skull base lesions, and cranial nerve pathology such as the optic nerve and any of the cranial nerves. Yet another benefit of fat suppression techniques is the ability to prove that a lesion contains fat. So here we have a lesion in the quadrigeminal plate cistern right of midline that is largely T1 hyperintense that once we apply suppression to it, the high signal drops out and proves that this lesion contains fat and this is a benign lipoma. All these sequences we've described have an identifiable pattern. T1-weighted images, fluid is dark. Gray-white differentiation is anatomic. T2-weighted images, fluid is bright. Reverse, anatomic. Flare is T2-weighted image on steroids with dark fluid. Diffusion-weighted image, critical for the evaluation of stroke. Susceptibility-weighted and T2-star-weighted images exhibit very dark veins and highlight calcifications and hemorrhagic products. T1-weighted post-contrast images exhibit the T1 shortening caused by gadolinium, and you'll really want to focus on the nose to look for true contrast enhancement. Don't rely on the signal of vessels. Fat suppressed images are useful because they knock down the signal in the fat and allow you to see subtle contrast enhancement in adjacent structures, and also can prove that a lesion contains fat. So to partially reiterate, all these sequences are also useful for particular types of pathology. So for example, T1 weighted images is great for looking for hemorrhage and a certain other subset of T1 hyperintense pathology. T2 weighted imaging, pretty general. Lots of things that are going to be quite bright on T2 are things that have edema. But it can be useful to age blood products and to age a stroke to evaluate just how many blood vessels are within a tumor. Turbo flare, great for identifying and precisely localizing pathology. Diffusion weighted imaging, along with ADC map, is useful to evaluate for stroke and certain other kinds of restricted diffusion, such as pyogenic abscess, and densely packed tumor cells. Susceptibility weighted images again, and its older brother, the T2 star weighted images, are good for identifying hemorrhage and calcification and anything else that screws up the local magnetic field. Post contrast images obviously useful for enhancement of tumors and any other sort of pathologic enhancement sometimes associated with blood brain barrier breakdown. T1 weighted fat saturated images are again useful for looking at areas where fat is normally going to mask subtle enhancements such as in the bone marrow, along cranial nerves, and in the soft tissues of the neck or spine. Heavily T2 weighted images such as drive, space, cysts are useful for evaluating the cranial nerves and potential neurovascular impingement. Thank you very much for your attention.